I thought this story would be particularly appropriate for this new series as we're starting it. So I was, I was a young man, uh, still kind of a new driver, and, and I admit I might have made a mistake. I, I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you're making a left-hand turn onto a four-lane road, and somebody is coming in the outside lane, the trick is to make sure that you stay in the inner lane. And because I was a new driver, I might have gone over into his lane, or it may have also been that uh, just seeing me out of the corner of his eye coming out of him, he had to swerve. And this was about the age when the term road rage was starting to become common, and they might have chosen that term to describe this guy, because he went ballistic, honking on the horn, swerving all over the road, sticking his hand and his finger out the window, his head screaming and cursing at me. Uh, it was kind of scary. I didn't know quite what to do. But I went down a little bit further on that road, and then I made like a sharp turn into the parking lot of the restaurant where I worked. I kind of felt safe there. And this guy did a turn across four lanes of traffic to pull into the parking lot in front of me. He jumped out of his truck, and the first thing that struck me is that this guy was, and I don't know any other way to describe it, he was disfigured. He had a large dent in his head. Some kind of catastrophic accident had, had happened in his life. I mean, his, his one eye was not symmetrical with the other. And it occurred to me later that this was a guy to whom life had been kind of unkind. And he probably had gotten a bit of a complex. Maybe he was an angry person because of this. I couldn't imagine that in his lifetime, maybe even multiple times, a child would go, look at that man, mommy, or that people would do a double take or would wince in sympathy of how he looked. He jumped out of his truck, and he's still screaming at me. Uh, he whipped back the door of what I realized was a plumbing truck, um, and built into the wall of it were like these cubbies, and he continued screaming at me that I'd almost hit him, uh, that plumbing supplies had gotten scattered all over the van, and he was going to have to sort all these back into their place. And you know, our, our brains, uh, deep in the animal part, have like this fight or flight response. And I'm quite sure that if I had chosen fight, I would be standing in front of you with a dent in my head, because I think this guy would have picked up a pipe and beat on me. But I had pulled into the parking lot uh, in order so that I could run into the restaurant. I had people that knew me. I knew places to hide there. So that was an option as well. But somebody taught me, one of our members, Tommy Shireman, said one of the things that touches him about Jesus is Jesus would often choose the third way. And I certainly didn't have this as a conscious thought, but I, I'd like to think that my Christian upbringing, the faith journey that I was on, helped me to make another choice instead of fight or flight. And so I said, I'm sorry. I will help you to put everything back where it belongs. And it was like the anger just drained away from him. And he went, no, that's fine. He slammed the door shut, jumped in, and drove off. And that was it. Because kindness has the capacity to change us. Kindness. And I've been thinking about this a while. I've been paying attention to what I see in the news, how I see people treat each other. And I've been thinking, maybe we need to talk about this. And then, I don't know if you've seen the campaign by the Hartford County Public Library, Choose Civility. But when I started to see this campaign, I went, yes! This is what we need to talk about. And I was so impressed that this is our public library. You don't usually think of the public library as being in charge of helping us to be better people, but they're tackling this, and I love this. 
So I thought our series would be choose kindness. Civility isn't a word we find in the, the Bible, but kindness is all around the scriptures. Um, and the library was wonderful to give us a whole bunch of the materials that they have created for this series. They're on the table in the back. Um, there's bookmarks, there's flyers that have these reminders about kindness, um, different uh, resources. Uh, but I've also started thinking, what is it, why is it that we're so much more nasty uh, than, than I think we have been in the past? I've been thinking about this. Sociologists have actually been studying this, and there are some things that are happening. I think TV and media has kind of increased our, our coarseness. You know, reality TV shows where they encourage them to be mean to each other. The talking heads um, who we see uh, delivering mean kind of conversation and, and interaction with each other. I think TV and media has ramped this up a little bit. I think politics has ramped this up a little bit. Politics has never been a, uh, for kind of the faint of heart, um, but in particular, and I don't usually get real political, but for me, the president is somebody who's supposed to help heal us and help us to get along together and, and kind of communicate better. And we definitely have a president that doesn't see that as his role at all. I think that's kind of worsening things. I think electronic communication has worsened our, our communication with each other. Um, you know, people can sit behind a, a computer screen or their phone screen and they can write and say things that I'm not sure they would ever say. In fact, I know people who are very kind in person, who relate to each other um, and would give you the shirt off their back and, and would, would be helpful to you, but put them behind a screen where they don't have to see the response. They were standing in front of you and they said that, they would see the look on your face, they might see the tears in your eyes, and they would stop. But behind the screen, just let them have it in the blog or the email or the text or the, the Facebook post or Twitter or whatever it is, and we get a whole lot coarser and meaner. And we're sitting here in church. I would have to say that I think the decrease in faith, that less people describe themselves as a person of faith, has also affected our interactions, especially for us followers of Jesus, who kindness and love was so much a part of his message that if there's less people who are buying into that and growing in faith, there's going to be more nastiness. So I started to mention before, there's all kinds of resources in the back on the table to help you think a little bit about how to change our discourse. There's bookmarks and flyers. Um, there's information on the growth groups. There's one tonight and two on Tuesday that you can be a part of to kind of grow and, and learn a little bit more about kindness. And as I said to the kids, I'm so excited that they're learning the same lesson we are this morning. When the Kids Safari uh, leaders and I got together, we chose stories for them and for us. And we decided to start with the Old Testament, with a good foundation in the Ten Commandments. So let me go ahead and read to you the Ten Commandments from Exodus, the 20th chapter. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the, na the, the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and the, all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. 
Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I feel like in these Ten Commandments, there are some baseline foundations for us on kindness. So a couple things I think we kind of take from the Ten Commandments is notice a lot of them, more of them, are focused on others. The way I learned the Ten Commandments uh, was 316. That helped me memorize them. 316. The first three deal with our relationship with God, and that is appropriate. But then the next seven, the fourth with mother and father, and then the next six are all about how we relate to one another. That it isn't enough just to say, well, me and God are good and I'm, I'm following and, and, and not any graven images or using God's name in vain or taking the Sabbath, but how I treat other people matters as well. So they go on to focus on our relationship with others. And this is so important for our faith, not just God, but how we treat other people. Another thing I noticed about the Ten Commandments, too, I, I, it helped me to memorize them in kind of noticing that they move from very bad to less bad, but that, like in life, it can flow one thing from the next. So the, the uh, Fifth Commandment, uh, thou shall not murder. Uh, but then two after that, thou shall not steal. That, that can sometimes connect with that. In fact, one of our, our members was sharing a painful story uh, about a, a loved one uh, where there was a, a robbery that went wrong and ended up uh, with murder. That these things are interconnected. Um, that you start down that list and the things that the coveting can easily lead back to the stealing. Uh, that all those things are interconnected. Um, and from the Choose Civility campaign, or it's actually based on a book called Choosing Civility, there are reminders in that campaign, things like respect others or speak kindly. Speak kindly directly from the Eighth Commandment, that how we use our words matters. In fact, in the book, uh, Choosing Civility, um, or in the growth group curriculum that one of our members, Shelly Mizan, wrote, did a great job with that. She's wearing her kindness shirt, in fact, in the back. She quotes from the book, reminding us of how anybody that we're, we're standing in front of is a, is a human being, a fragile human being, and that how our words are used affects and changes them that we have to be careful about all of those others. And then a third thing that's actually part of, of our Lutheran history about the Ten Commandments. If you don't know uh, about Lutherans, uh, in the late 1400s and early 1500s, there was a, a monk and a pastor uh, who tried to reform and improve and change the church. And one of the gifts he gave to the church was a little booklet he wrote called the small catechism. See, when he was a pastor, he realized that the adults and the kids didn't know the basics of faith. So he, in this little, he would ask himself a question and then he would answer it. And so he would write about the Ten Commandments, things like, um, you shall not murder. What does this mean? And then he would go ahead and answer his own question. And interestingly, he wouldn't just focus on the negative but he'd turn it around and think about the positive. For example, you should fear and love God so that you do not heart, hurt or harm your neighbor in his body, the negative, but help and support him in every physical need. See, it kind of reminds us it isn't just about not doing harm, but doing some kindness, helping them as well. Or the Eighth Commandment. Um, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbors, betray or slander them, or destroy their reputations. Don't do the negative, but instead we are to come to their defense 
speak well of them, and interpret everything they do in the best possible light. What a great description that we look at our neighbor and say, I'm going to look at them for the very best in them. It's a great reminder about the Ten Commandments, not just doing the negative, but encouraging the positive as well. Let me highlight one last thing on the back table as well. Oh, I should say, by the way, that I printed copies of the Ten Commandments in the small catechism. If you've never read them before and you'd like a copy, they're on the back table. And also on the back table are Choose Kindness bracelets, just like I gave to the kids. So I was working on this series. I, I wanted some way for us to be reminded on a regular basis that the way we treat others matter. So there's bracelets back there. I, I imagine a day when things are tense. Hopefully you're not standing in front of an angry plumber who wants to beat the snot out of you. Um, but in some situation, and then you see your bracelet, and you think, I have the choice to choose kindness. And that that might change that situation dramatically. Jesus, we know, probably did not have a choose kindness bracelet. But he absolutely chose kindness again and again. And we'll look next week at some of Jesus' best teaching about choosing kindness. Amen.